Remember paganism? Wasn't Shakespeare's attitude to paganism? He's saying, look, I might be a little bit pale. First of all, Shakespeare's father was a Catholic. See? He hated the Jesuits. But he was so orthodox that he believes in everything the Pope. He doesn't believe in infallibility. You know, I, 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 I'll debauch, screw, drink this and that, but when I put on the Pope, the people rose. Suddenly I, I become infallible. I mean, tell that to the Marines or to the Borges, if you like. Alexander VI. The Borges, you see, uh, Alexander VI, Pope Alexander VI, lived in the, in the reign of the grandfather of Elizabeth, Henry himself. Lucretia Borgia and Cesare Borgia and all that. Alexander VI was the brother of Cesare Borgia. Lucretia was his daughter. And he made a child with Lucretia. You know the story, you guys? What year was it? Is it this? Uh, I know Henry VII is 1485 to 1509. And during that time, the Borges did their thing in Italy. And a little bit out. Spain, you know, Ferrara. And um, he made a child with, 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 with Lucrezia. And then married her off to give the child a name. And then killed the first husband and got all married to the Duke of Ferrara. You know the stories? Look at the operas, anyhow. Lucio de la Namor. Don't look at the Orson Welles version. The Orson Welles version I like is um, well, this is an old pope, you know, he likes young women. (laughs) (laughs) This pope had this, yeah, this is, just don't take my word. Go in the library, get the books. You know, the the Roman Catholic (laughs) videos are here. It's when he put on the robes, he's going to be holy after that. <laughs> in the Orson Welles film, this Pope is there, acted by Felix Eilman, and the young girl is near him, and Welles comes up. <laughs> spring in the lap of winter. <laughs> the young girl is spring. He's with him. So, so, what about paganism and the different religions? People who believe in all sorts of the animists, you know, an animist who believes that a chair has a spirit, a cup has a spirit of animism. People have some kooky religion, you know. And um, what about those? The, the only religion that, that attracted me as a boy was one that people used to exorcise. I understand you've been exorcising. This guy used to get a lot of middle class people down into this street in Guyana, in Georgia, beat them. I mean, beat the Mexican, and they paid him for it. <clears throat> and I used to envy the guy because I'd like to get this. <laughs> and, get, and get money for it too, you know? <laughs> mm, the devil is coming out, you know? He's beating the shit out of me. I never got that Exorcism. Never got that job. But it, it looked attractive. <laughs> you know? And you'd be surprised to see the people uh, who were university graduates and all that going to this thing, you know? And who came out? The body's belted and, 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 and torn, contusions and abrasions, but if you go afterwards, <laughs> I tell you, well, I, I was so sorry that nobody believed in me sufficiently to cover that. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'd have made a kind of bet. <laughs> I wouldn't have been here, but by now I, I've been up to my billions. Very <laughs> 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 stupid, you know. <laughs> anyway, Shakespeare is saying that he doesn't, so like I was Catholic, I'm Puritan, you have pagans, you have this, you have infidels, Muslims, Jews, whatever. The important thing about all those beliefs, systems of belief, is whether they are consistent with natural law, consonant with natural law. If they are not consonant with natural law, they're bad. That's his interest. And so what does he do? He puts two platonic figures in the play. And being Shakespeare, and not Tennessee Williams, he's clever. He makes a clown, the fool, <coughs> a platonic figure. Then he makes a tragic fellow, Kent, 
So tragedy and comedy. In a tragedy, both talking reason, speaking reason. That's what They're the good guys, if you like, if you call this modern critical nonsense of the Jews. But they're the famous talking reason, singing songs. I would, you mad, you damn nonsense, <laughs> you know. That's mad. Why do you give your power to, you know? You think I'm a fool? You're more fool. Yes. You gave away all you have to your daughters. You know. You were their age, they're not your age. You could never be, you know. And you can't give him advice. False recreant, get thee hence. You know, leave the kingdom. And then Shakespeare notices this business of France. You see, the superpowers. After Spain was defeated in 1588, the Spanish Armada, the superpowers became France and Britain. She was always not as strong as today. In those days, a few ships and shooting a few guns, you know, it got galleons and things. But they're the big powers. They could beat everybody else. And he's warning now about France. So Cordelia marries the king of France. So she comes over to help her father. You know what he lets the king of France do? Which is not a historical fact. He does a Cleopatra. Before the battle is fought, the king of France goes back to France and leaves Cordelia. Just as Cleopatra had acted, left the battle, left Anthony to face uh, Octavius. Deserting, desertion in the face of the enemy, if you like. So he's warning them. It is all right to invite foreign powers to come and help you settle an internal matter of succession. But they will consult their own interests. You know what? Act in your interests. <laughs> the king of France isn't going to come to put Lear in the throne because Lear is a good man or a worthy man. He will do whatever suits France. And what suits France? If the whole thing is in chaos, Cordelia dies, Goneril dies, Regan dies, Lear dies, Edmund dies, the whole place dies, the Gloucester is blind, you know. That's what suits France. Because once you have chaos, then you are weak and you are wrecked. Once you So that's what you, you have to watch for. So Shakespeare is saying, I know all these pagans exist, but make sure it's consistent with natural law. I don't give a damn people come and tell me, hey, look, I, I have a new religion. I'm an Orwellian, or I'm a something alien, or whatever. What are the principles? Hmm? You believe in abortion, and murder, and famine, and destruction, and locusts, and things like that. If you believe in those things, then I don't believe in your religion. It must be consistent. Every universal religion must satisfy that criteria, naturally. So he lets Edmund say, nature is my God, Edmund's a bastard. But nature is your God too. Not because you're a bastard born out of wedlock that nature isn't your God. You know? A natural law, and the biggest crime, the biggest offenses, are the offenses against natural law. And if you hand over power to the wicked, you break the natural order of things and you produce chaos. If you whimsically deal with succession by giving your daughters, you do. And what is madness? That's his own thesis. Is Lear mad? We know for sure that some men pretend to be mad. Edgar. The law puts on lost if he tends to be mad. Lear at one stage say, I am mad, but is he really mad? Who is really mad? And what is madness? Let us examine all this reference to Bartholomew and Bedlam he makes in What is madness? I'm sure you must have met people tell that, hey, you mad. Or, or LaRouche is mad, or whatever. People like thoughts 
with which they can be comfortable. If a person is uncomfortable with thought, he thinks you're mad. If you stand up in my club right in one day and say, I'm from this damn shit about reaching out, every damn television thing says, reach out to the venereal disease, reach out to this, reach out. I said, fuck this reaching out, I'm kind of bad. You know? Well, reach out to their minds. I make it. They think I'm mad. They think I'm mad. And liberals always think you're mad. <laughs> but if you want to see madness, in 1976, in the midst of my, my little bits and pieces, I go around the world. I go to a conference in, in the Philippines, Manila, where this man, Mahapas, and his wife, Imelda, with many shoes. <laughs> this movement sometimes makes some, some peculiar judgments. <laughs> This <laughs> man's a thug, yeah? <laughs> anyway, I don't know Peel, so I'm not saying she's good. But I know him. Or right. uh, then I come across after that I had to see Kissinger. So I leave. I went this way around. <laughs> then I went to San Francisco to come over to Washington. And that was the I too. And um I was in San Francisco and I was in California. They were trying to get a party horse. If that place isn't mad, <laughs> I don't know what madness is. A woman is walking down the strand, street, with half her ass outside. I mean this. Literally half her ass outside. And nobody bats an eyelid, you know. Guy says, get out of my space. So I said, what space are you talking about? What's your definition of space? You know? That's, is that not madness? <laughs> well, you, I don't know. I could detect no theme of rationality in California. <laughs> San Francisco, Sacramento, Oakland, Los Angeles, you know? I could detect no seal of rationality. Really, I couldn't. There's no water to Los Angeles, right? The angels. <laughs> Los Angeles. Hmm? Then there's a girl standing in the doorway with a fellow under my hotel. I'm staying at a big plush hotel that this Ghana government had me at. Transit Century Fox. I'm coming downstairs and people are making love right there. And she's making love in English, having orgasms in Spanish. Love <laughs> <laughs> me, you know. Honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me that place isn't mad? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> this place was so what is madness? <laughs> the British define madness as being he has a late laugh. Late, just a late laugh. <laughs> 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 All right. Suffering from such a defect of reason as not to know the difference between right and wrong. Or if you did know, not knowing it was against the law. <laughs> not to know a defect of reason. Do you think that reason is a state of mind, a condition? You suffer a defect of it, like a fixed quantity of reason, and you lack some. Is that what reason is about? Isn't it really <coughs> speaking? I remember seeing a briefing sometime this year, a 
Lynn was saying that if you peel away, like the onion skin, you know, you're peeling away all the circuit, you come to a hard core of truth, even with the biggest madman. The idea being, I look, you didn't say it this way, but I put it this way. Madness is, a, is having a set of false theories of causation. A madman thinks that he fell down because the moon blew. Some damn false That's theories right. of causation. And if you go behind these theories of causation, you end up at some hypothesis which is true, from which he deviated. <coughs> The biggest madman. So beyond psychoanalysis, which I'm quite sure you remember, because <laughs> I read that, if you go beyond psychoanalysis, you end up investigating the, the theories of causation of the individuals. Isn't your problem out there with the people trying to mobilize that they, they don't know what causes what? Isn't that what you're going to get through? That's why they're mad. They don't know what causes what. And I remember, I have an aunt living in California now, mm -hmm. hard for after two months he was suffocated. And we got to analyze characters, people, and events on the basis of why, what causes what. Is it really sufficient to say, hey, look, 400 federal water officers went to Leesburg and Banking Rams. They say they went because they wanted to get evidence of this, that, and other. You ask why again, but why? And then why? And then why until you come to the unhypothesized hypothesis? That is what being a business is about. And if you use that technique, epistemological technique in your private lives, half the grief will happen. Some girl comes up to you, I love you, let's get married. Well, why, why did she say that? Well, we don't think it's swell your head. You pat you in the back of your head swell. Curious form of anatomy. <laughs> check why. Why, you know, profile it and check why. Do you profile institutions? Do you profile events? Do you find out why? Do you do that? Or do you just let what will be be? That's Tennyson, no? I'm so deeply spitten through the hell. I cannot last till morn. Therefore, he'll take my soul Excalibur. Turn far into the middle mirror. What didst thou see, Salas? The last of combat. So, I heard the ripple washing in the reed. While the water tapping the crack. Was <laughs> the religious mysticism. <coughs> said, no, you, you didn't throw it. Lance said, well, the high reserve. You know, like, you know, do bright business in Fourteenth Street in Manhattan. But uh, in the end, he threw it. What happened? Out came a hand, borrowed his on the middle mirror and grasp the sword Excalibur. Uh, I was telling somebody over there just now. So, oh, our duty is to be relentless in the pursuit of causation. Always <laughs> ask why. And if the why, the answer is irrational, it's wrong. Why did Lair divide up his kingdom between his thumbs? He had no, gave no good reason, so it's wrong. It's irrational. Irrational. You are supposed to ask, don't let them ram things down your throat. <clears throat> Why is your daughter on dope? Some guy tells you, some liberal, her friends use it. So why does she use it? Because her friends use it. Well, why does she do what her friends do? Because she doesn't use her mind. So why doesn't she use her mind? You see what's happening now? See where you're going? You get into the, the root of the problem. But you have to keep asking why. You see, the difference between Leibniz and Newton is that. Newton believed, and the Descartes for that matter, in formal causation. You look at the universe and you see relationships. 
see? This thing falls and it increases its speed, whatever. What causes that from force to gravity? That's formal causes, that's not efficient. Why that happens? You go home now, don't take my word. Go to a library or look at your own books and see whether Newton can explain why do all the planets orbit in the same direction? It isn't that one, well, you know that it doesn't just go straight, it goes so, 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 but they're all in the same direction. Why? Or do you, can you find him explaining what is the origin of how the planets got to be there in the first place? He can't say, he says, hypothesis non thingo est, I don't make hypothesis. I explain behavior, what I see. He doesn't ask why. Why does the earth go around the sun? Does the sun move? If so, why? Does the, sun, the sun does move. Does it also move in its axis? The answer is yes. But why? Why are there human beings on Earth and not on Mars and Mercury and Venus? Why? That's what science is about. Not some stupid ass sitting down and say, I observe. Did you know that no?